All right, so I wanted to give you a quick talk on uh, the alt alteration of mental status. So first of all, let's define our terms. So mental status has two portions to it. There's arousal and there's awareness. So one is how wakeful and responsive you are and how aware you are of your environment. So encephalopathy, sorry, I spelled that wrong, or delirium, sorry this about that, uh, which we end up seeing a lot is usually transient and reversible, and there's decreased, uh, is typified by decreased attention span and waxing and waning confusion. So uh, people who are encephalopathic, which is what we call it in neurology, is um, they have poor attention. So when you do your mental status exam, what they'll do really poorly in is they may name, they may repeat, they may comp comprehend fairly well, but concentration tasks are poor. So an example of a concentration task is, for instance, doing the days of the week forward and then backwards. They'll often get laid up on Wednesday. For mild encephalopathy, you may find that they have problems with the months of the year. Um, uh, sometimes people will have them sp people spell world backwards, but these are all concentration tasks which are primarily affected in encephalopathy. So differentiating a delirium from a dementia tends to come along these ways. So deliriums tend to be acute to subacute. The course of delirium is typically fluctuating. So someone will call you when they say the person's really delted and you come and see them and they're okay. Or you, they say it's only mild and then you see it and it's quite severe. The attention will fluctuate. So as you talk to them, they'll be easily distracted. It'll be hard to keep them on point really demented patients you you can really engage even for a short term the sensorium will be um will be impaired they'll be they'll be the sensorium will be not be clear they may hallucinate they may um confabulate they may um see things they they'll the sensorium will, will not be normal all the aspects of cognitive function will be globally impaired so when you do your mental status exam everything might be out um, along with attention really with dementia it's they're often um, unless they're really end stage it's really memory that is the most uh, significant aspect that's affected um, visual hallucinations are not uncommon with uh, with encephalopathic patients um, even mildly encephalopathic patients um, uh, delusions are more comp common in dementia patients so the other thing that we have to be really careful about is not confusing aphasia with encephalopathy. And this happens a fair amount. So anterior types of aphasias or Broca's aphasias are really rarely confused with confusion. Um, they are usually a non-fluent stuttering or halting type of aphasia. Uh, people have a problem with getting a word out. Uh, they trip up over words. They trip up over syllables. Uh, they can't name things at all. They can't um, write, uh, although they can read. Um, uh, they have poor repetition, but they really have excellent comprehension. A posterior aphasia is probably uh, the one that's often confused with confusion the most. Um, they'll often have a word salad. They'll have poor naming, poor comprehension, uh, poor repetition, sorry, that should say. Um, they'll, uh, they'll often sort of talk ragtime. Uh, just mean talking about lots of things, but attention is the key. In general, uh, people with uh, with a Wernicke should be able to attend to you, um, should not be easily distracted. They often have sensory change, and uh, they'll often have a visual field cut. So it is important in, in encephalopathic patients where you're not clear whether it's aphasia or encephalopathy to, to do the full exam, especially to look for um, sensory loss or visual field cuts. So encephalopathy is very frequent. It happens in almost 50% of, of elderly hospitalized patients and almost 50% of ICU patients. Um, patients who are admitted with delirium, their mortality is quite high. It can be upwards of 25%, and that's primarily due to the secondary pathology causing it. Um, it uh, correlates with long hospital stays uh, and increased complications, increased cost, and long-term disability. So drugs, 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 drugs. Medications are the most often implicated cause of delirium, um, especially benzodiazepines, opiates, anticholinergics. Um, for opiates, you want to look for small pupils, decreased respirations and hypotension. That ends up being fairly significant uh, for, um, for uh, uh, significant findings when you're talking about uh, opiates. We'll often see this um, 
on the surgery service after they've been started on a PCA with it. Sometimes it's an acute stroke call and sometimes it's Delta MS and they'll have small pupils and it's often um, opiate use. Anticholinergics, bradycardic, you know, salivation, lacrimation, diaphoresis um, from, uh, from medications, especially those with bradycardia. So Fanukin is one of the internists here at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, and he always uh, curses about policy pharmacy and the elderly. You know, remember to look at kidney function and make sure everything's appropriately dosed. Look for drug-drug interactions when you're when you're when you're out of uh, when you're when you're trying to figure this out. Stop anything that's anticholinergic, uh, and really just stop all unnecessary medications. So hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is not an uncommon cause for us to get called for alteration of mental status. Um, overly aggressive insulin, renal failure, liver failure, sepsis, infection, too much alcohol use. Um, really, you know, adrenal insufficiency and insulin are really much less common, uh, but we, uh, but every now and then. So when you see somebody and they're delted and they're sweaty, you know, you want to think about a finger stick. Hypoxia. So this is not uncommon um, that uh, we'll be called to see someone and it ends up being uh, hypoxia. Uh, there can be hypoventilation and shunt, an increased diffusion gradient, decreased FiO2, VQ mismatch. Um, sometimes what will happen is, is that patients are placed on a little bit too much oxygen and they, um, and they become hypercarbic. Um, Hypoperfusion, anything that decreases cerebral blood flow can alter the mental status. So people with CHF, people with SIRS or sepsis, hypovolemia, myocardial infarct or shock, any of these, uh, anything that causes hypoperfusion in a global process, you really have to, you really want to assign that as a cause to alteration of mental status. People don't have sepsis. Um, and uh, hypotension and bad CHF without having an alteration to mental status. And that is a, a good explanation. You do want to make sure that when you see these people that you uh, make sure that you're, uh, that you're suggesting uh, a higher level of care if they're not being properly managed. So just a word on sepsis. Um, and uh, we will occasionally see people who, who meet criteria for SIRS and they're asking why they're they're altered. Remember, SIRS needs more than one of the following. Temperature, elevated heart rate, tachypnea, elevated blood count. You need at least uh, two SIRS criteria by a known cause infection to be sepsis. Severe sepsis has acute organ function. Septic shock is persistent or refractory hypotension or tissue perfusion despite adequate fluid resuscitation. Um, so, uh, and uh, that is a very good reason to have an alteration of mental status, especially decreased attention. Um, um, a lot of electrolyte abnormalities, especially hypernatremia and hyponatremia, um, especially severe hypo or hypercalcemia, not usually mild calcium changes, but, you know, really significant calcium changes. But, but elevations in BUN absolutely, absolutely will, uh, will do it. Elevations in ammonia absolutely do it, will do it. So speaking of hepatic encephalopathy, um, you know the that the uh, liver failure is a is a classic uh, cause of alteration of mental status. Uh, really, when you start having uh, alteration of mental status from hepatic failure, you should begin to have some asterixis. But as it becomes more and more severe, you can get slurred speech, you can get hyperreflexia, uh, you can get rigidity. It can really become quite severe as well as coma. So in patients who have poor hepatic function or history of poor hepatic function, really think about ammonia and, and look for esterixis. And this is just the um, this is just a little slide on um, how the psychiatric and neurologic symptoms really begin quite um, early. Uh, in the in the process before any of the other findings. So alcohol withdrawal, boy, alcohol withdrawal is a really important cause of alteration of the mental status. Um, uh, they uh, this usually happens before seizures, so they'll have minor withdrawal symptoms, tremulousness, anxiety, um, and then really develop uh, alteration of mental status problems with attention. Um, you know, really six to 12 hours, it'll begin. And they may not start having alcohol withdrawal seizures for a day or two. Um, the delirium 
tremulans, the really bad uh, alteration of mental status may not start for 72 hours, but there's often some alteration of mental status that happens before the seizures. So do think about alcohol withdrawal. Of course, we love to uh, think about CNS infections. These are relatively rare in the whole scope of, um, of alteration of mental status. Um, really, they'll have elevated uh, uh, white count, they'll have a stiff neck, um, they, they will have a fever for the most part. Um, people with alteration of mental status with fever um, and no other obvious source of uh, infection, you really start to have to think about recommending uh, lumbar puncture. So seizures. So seizures, we think seizures are really important of alteration of mental status, not only because we're a neurologist, but because people don't think of it nearly enough. So um, status epilepticus, which we've talked about before, um, is a very morbid uh, uh, issue. Uh, classically, uh, status epilepticus of the classic type is tonic clock jerking, loss of bowel bladder, uh, and they'll have a postictal confusional state. And the confusional state is usually um, an encephalopathy type picture. The difficulty is, is there's a process called non-convulsive status epilepticus. Um, and uh, I'll tell you that Peter Kaplan, who's the director of, of uh, uh, epilepsy here at Bayview, is the world expert on this uh, on this uh, disorder, and uh, we see it not infrequently. Uh, so you'll have someone who's normal, and then maybe has a seizure history, and then becomes delta and nobody can find the reason for the change in mental status. You do want to think about a, uh, an EEG in those patients, and we'll talk a little bit about why we EEG people. But the the short uh, the short issue is that episodically you'll find non-convulsive status epilepticus as the cause of uh, unexplained change in mental status, which is a treatable disorder. The other issue with the EEG is, is that it actually can help you uh, quantify and delineate change in mental status or encephalopathy. So there are fairly typical changes that occur in EEG associated with metabolic encephalopathy, with hepatic encephalopathy, with, with lithium toxicity, with drug abuse, with status epilepticus. So we do often like to do EEG in patients um, when there's a change in mental status and we're not able to different to to uh, say why exactly to uh, to quantify the amount of change in mental status and to rule out seizures, which are which are an eminently treatable uh, disorder. So serotonin syndrome doesn't happen so often, but it does happen every now and then. So people who are on a lot of serotonergic uh, medications can absolutely uh, have. Um, some uh, alteration of mental status. They tend to be febrile. Uh, they tend to have um, chills. They tend to have increased reflexes. Um, they are. They do have a acute confusional state. Um, they are usually on multiple serotonergic agents. So, <clears throat> of course, you know this is the sort of thing that we they always worry about. So, interparenchymal hemorrhage. Really, um, it can. This is a CT scan, and the the white areas are hemorrhage. So anything that is space occupying in the brain can cause an alteration of mental status. For the most part, you're going to see other neurologic findings. So you do in your Delta MS patients, you want to make sure that you do your exam the best that you can to look for focal findings that would suggest a, 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 a focal process. So someone with, a, with an intracranial hemorrhage may have a confusional state, but should also have weakness and numbness and increased reflexes up going toe, should have other things on their examination that's that's focal on one side. You know, when in doubt, a CT scan is not unreasonable um, looking for intracerebral hemorrhage. This happens especially acutely when you have you see people on the floor when they have focality. So um, here's a patient with a CT scan and you can see that there's a loss of the um, loss of the ventricle on one side and on the patient left there's a large hypodense subdural hematoma. So subacute, uh, so acute subdurals after uh, after a fall, you know, people will tend to pick up on that history. Um, what sometimes gets missed is the subacute or chronic subdural hematomas, um, where you just get sort of these mild findings. Really, this patient has a left-sided um, subdural hematoma. That's going to be fairly easy to pick up on examination. Really, it's the right-sided lesions that can look all the world like a acute confusional state. Um, 
So uh, you do want to uh, pay attention to your left sided weakness, your left sided neglects, your left sided uh, sensory loss when you're looking at patients, uh, when you're looking for focal neurologic process that will give you an alteration of mental status. So in general, patients in the dominant hemisphere will have aphasia, they'll have fill cut, they'll have weakness, they'll have sensory loss. But really in the right hemisphere, the right hemisphere can hide a lot of um, uh, uh, lesions and you really want to be careful. Um, the old the old school teaching is, is that an, uh, an encephalopathy can be caused by anything in the right hemisphere. So here we have, we if you've done the CT uh, section already, you, you know what this is. This is a lens-shaped uh, hemorrhage within the uh, right side of the brain, and this is an epidural hematoma. These, um, these will sometimes cause alteration of mental status. Uh, usually it's sleepiness. Um, it, there's usually a head trauma uh, associated with it. Um, it is a neurosurgical emergency, so if you image people and you see this, that is something to look out for. Um, so someone comes in and they have the worst headache of their life and they have an alteration of mental status, you do want to think about uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage and that will typically be evident on, um, on CT. Embolic strokes, so this is, a, this is a great scan. I like this one because what this shows is small embolic strokes within the, uh, within the non-dominant hemisphere. So these can be really difficult to pick up for non-neurologists where, um, um, where uh, you see uh, people uh, on the cardiac surgery service or in medicine or people are in atrial fibrillation or in cardiology and they ha all of a sudden have an acute change in their mental status. They have a little bit of left side weakness and maybe they have a um, confusional state uh, and maybe they have a little bit of neglect and you can see embolic strokes and these are a couple of embolic strokes on the right side which where it can be fairly difficult to pick up by examination um, so press is a, a disorder that uh, presents with alteration of mental status uh, there can be some visual field abnormalities and it's usually in association with um, hypertension is what we call it. It's also called hypertensive encephalopathy. Um, uh, so a reversible, uh, a posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome associated with hypertension will sometimes look like this on MR imaging. Um, they'll often have very high blood pressures. You do want to make sure that you're not talking about stroke, especially within the posterior circulation, that can uh, present in the same way. So um, finally, sundowning. So sundowning is a group of behaviors that occur in older patients with or without dementia, really at time of a nightfall or sunset. And they can be confused and agitated and aggressive. They can have pacing and wandering. They can be disruptive. They can be increased verbal activity. Um, uh, these We don't tend to get consults like this from geriatrics and from internal medicine, but uh, sometimes in the surgical services we will. Um, you want to make sure not to use um, a benzodiazepine that will just worsen this uh, the syndrome. If if necessary, you can represent, you can uh, uh, suggest some of the antipsychotics. But this is uh, fairly uh, fairly common. They will they will have agitation and anxiety, and they will have some difficulty with um, concentration. So um, in terms of uh, the, in summary, you know, you really, when you see patients, you really want to make sure there isn't aphasia. That can be very difficult. You do want to consider non-convulsive status and, and primarily because you know, internal medicine knows these, uh, knows these, all these other disorders well, but, but this uh, syndrome of non-convulsive status happens not infrequently, especially in people who have a history of, of seizures. Um, so if someone comes in and they have a seizure with a known seizure disorder and they have a really prolonged post-dictal confusional state, you do want to think about non-convulsive status epilepticus. Um, often it's a hunt for the cause. So we'll come and see people and we'll say no focality, metabolic encephalopathy. You just have to find the cause. Um, and sorry, there's another spelling mistake here. But it often takes a couple of days to improve a metabolic insult. So someone who has... Uh, acute renal failure, acute hepatic failure, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, um, sodium abnormality is really bad calcium abnormalities. Uh, the day that the, that the correction occurs is not going to be the day that they improve. It can, it can often take a little while to, uh, to improve. All right. Well, thank you very much.